Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. Uh, so it's a, it's a great uh, pleasure to introduce today's speaker. Ilya Rosenstein is a, a graduate student at MIT, uh, working under the supervision of uh, Peter and Dick. Uh, so he has done um, a lot of work on, on the nearest neighbor search. And uh, today he will tell us about some of uh, his recent work um, uh, on this topic. Thanks for the introduction. Uh, so I'll talk today about two recent papers of ours. Uh, and these papers are joined with uh, Alex Andoni from Columbia, Piotr Indyk, who, as Kostya said, is my advisor at MIT, Thijs Larhoven, who is a graduate student at Eindhoven, and Ludwig Schmidt, who is uh, another graduate student at MIT. So this is, this is my talk outline. Uh, essentially, I'll talk about these two results eventually, uh, but uh, both of them have pretty large common prefix, which I'll start with. So I'll start with defining the problem that we will be solving. And the problem is actually very easy to formulate. It's called near neighbor search. It has different names, but the basic idea is the following. So you have a data set which is n points in Rd, and you have a certain distance threshold R. Uh, so what you want is uh, you want to preprocess your data set so that given a query, find any data point within distance R from your query. Uh, so the parameters that we will care about will be mostly space uh, that your data structure occupies and query time. Uh, another parameter that we would naturally care about is preprocessing time, but usually if you can bring space down to something reasonable, then preprocessing time usually uh, can be made relatively fast as well. So let's not worry about it for now. Um, so at least in some scenarios, uh, there are great data structures for this problem. So a model case would be something like if all of your points are on the plane and the distance is Euclidean, then what you can do is you can build Voronoi diagram uh, and then uh, given a query, just perform a point location in this Voronoi diagram and that would give you the nearest neighbor. And so like using uh, more or less textbook algorithms and data structures, you can achieve linear space and logarithmic query time for this case. So unfortunately, uh, approaches like this are completely infeasible for the high dimensions. Uh, so the problem is if you would do something based on Voronoi diagrams and even more generally, uh, whatever data structures we know for the high dimensional case, uh, they require space that is exponential in your dimension. And that, that's definitely not that great. So at the same time, I would argue that all the fun in some sense happens in high dimensions. So many applications that are interesting, uh, they are definitely not on the plane, so it would be nice to do something about them. And what we will do, is, well, as good theoreticians, we will change the problem that we are solving. And so instead of exact nearest neighbors, we will be happy with approximate nearest neighbors. And the formal definition is like this. So in addition to the data set and the distance threshold, uh, we have approximation factor C, which is some real number larger than one. And uh, now we have the following uh, question. So suppose that I, I give you the query with the promise that there will be at least one data point within distance R. Uh, so then I want you to return any data point within distance CR from the query. So basically there are two balls and I know that there is at least one data point within the small ball, but I would be happy with any data point within the large ball. So is the definition clear? Good. So yeah, so near neighbor search or like similarity search or whatever you call it, it has quite a few applications. So the most obvious applications uh, are similarity search for all sorts of different data, images, audio, video, texts, biological data, and so on. But there are a couple of non, like, couple of applications of different sorts, so let me just briefly mention them. So th there is a recent one uh, for cryptanalysis. So namely, it turns out that nearest neighbor search uh, can be applied in practice for solving shortest vector problem in lattices, and it can give you pretty good speed ups. Um, and another application is for optimization. So uh, nearest neighbor search was used to speed up uh, different methods for optimization, such as coordinate descent or stochastic gradient descent. Um, so these two are relatively recent results. Um, and uh, actually, in this talk, we will be mostly looking at the specific case of nearest neighbor search. Uh, 
not for the whole talk, uh, we will consider general case as well, but important special case is when all of your points and queries lie on the unit sphere in RD. So uh, for certain reasons, it would be convenient to look at this case. And uh, it's actually relevant for both theoretical and practical reasons. So in theory, it turns out that we can reduce general case to the spherical case. And I'll, I'll show this reduction, well, at least I'll outline this reduction later in the talk. And in practice, uh, Euclidean distance on the sphere corresponds to cosine similarity, which is widely used by itself. But also, even if you don't want cosine similarity, you want like genuine Euclidean distance, sometimes you can pretend that your data set lines on the sphere and uh, you wouldn't lose much by doing that. Um, yeah. So even more specifically, uh, a special case that is good to have in mind would be spherical random case. So what's the setup here? So my data set is not only points on the sphere, but they are random points on the sphere, just chosen uniformly at random n times. And the uh, query, uh, I generate queries as follows. I take a random data point and plant query within 45 degrees, say, from a data point at random. And uh, what it looks like is uh, something on this picture. So basically, if I have a query, then I'll have a near neighbor within 45 degrees just because I generated it like this. But all the other data points will be tightly concentrated around 90 degrees just because if, if you sample endpoints on the sphere, they will be pairwise almost orthogonal unless you have like too many of them. And uh, just keep, keep this case in mind. It would be nice to illustrate uh, our algorithms on this case. And uh, in, in certain sense, it will be the core case as we'll see later. And again, in practice, what often happens is that actually concentration of angles around 90 degrees, it's not uncommon to see in practice. So it's, it's, also, it's also relevant for practice somehow, this case. So any questions about it? So that's it. So D is much larger than N? That's the setting. No, N is much larger than D, but let's say it's not like exponential in D. Let's say it's sub-exponential in D. So 2 to square root D, something like this. So of course, if you'll have lots of points, then you will not have that good concentration, but Okay, so that's it for the problem definition. Now let me introduce locality sensitive hashing. So if you have any questions, maybe you should ask them now. Okay, so what is locality sensitive hashing? So this is a technique introduced by Indic and Matwani in 98, and uh, this is the way to solve a uh, near neighbor problem in high dimensions. And the basic idea is pretty intuitive. So what you want is you want space partition of RD such that closer point, like it's, it, it will be random partition so that close, close pairs of points collide more often than far ones. So something in the spirit of this partition into random disks. Uh, so the formal definition here is the following. So I require my random partition to have the following two properties. So if my, if my points are close, then uh, they should collide with non-trivial probability under this random partition, say with probability at least P1. And if they are far, then they should collide not too often with probability less than P2. And uh, these R and CR distance thresholds are exactly from the definition of uh, approximate nearest neighbor. I, I cared about like close pairs and far pairs, and th th these are exactly the distance thresholds we care about. And a uh, useful way of thinking about it is if you have some random, random space partition, uh, it would most likely have some dependence on the probability of collision on the distance, and then these inequalities just tell you something about two specific, two specific points on this plot. Um, so actually now let me demonstrate one example of LSH. Uh, so not to think of it abstractly, but just have some concrete example in mind. And it's actually a very useful family. It's, used, it's very useful for both theory and practice. And it was introduced by Cherry Carr in 2002. And it's actually heavily inspired by um, a certain approximation algorithms by Gomans and Williamson, um, for those who understand. And the actually like hashing family, hashing family looks, uh, looks very simple. So it works only for the sphere. And if I'm on the sphere, what I can do is the following. I can sample a random unit vector uniformly, let's call it R, and then I hash my point into sign of the dot product of my point and R. So basically, Another way of saying it is we take a sphere and cut it into uh, equal pieces by a random hyperplane. Um, 
And it's very easy to compute exact probability of collision for two points. So if angle between my two points is alpha, then probability of collision is just 1 minus alpha over py. Well, because if you have two points, then uh, in order for your hyperplane to cut these two points, uh, you need this hyperplane to pass through this like angle between p and q. And probability of that is alpha over pi. And with the remaining probability, they actually collide. So that's why we have this expression. It's like exact formula. And on the plot, it would look something like this. So remember that we would care about random case, right? With 45 degrees. So if points are like 45 degrees, then probability of their collision is 3 quarters. And for 90 degrees is 1 half. So that's like typical case we would think about. OK, so we have this nice, simple family in mind. And let's now see how to use it to solve, like, to do similarity search in high dimensions. Um, so the first idea you would think about is to just take our hashing family and just hash my points using hashing family. So basically compute hashes, uh, and then just, uh, I don't know, look up points with the same hash. But of course it wouldn't work. For instance, for the hyperplane it wouldn't work because you have only two values of hash. So your points, in the best case, they would, they, would be split, like, they would be split evenly, and in each bucket you have n over two points, right? So you would need to enumerate n over two points, so that's too much. So a natural extension of this idea is instead of one hash function, use k-independent hash functions from my family. And, uh, so what are you trying to optimize? So running time. Query time, yeah. And space, but space even, let's not worry too much about it for now. So what are you aiming for, right? Uh, log n? Definitely we want sublinear query time, right? If, if we just use one hash function, even sublinear query time we won't get. Of course, I would want as, as good as possible. Um, so let's see what we get if we use k hash functions simultaneously instead of one. So for one hash function, probability of collision is, as I said before, it's just a straight line, right? But when we'll start increasing k, it actually goes down. Uh, this is more or less obvious. I mean, probability just gets raised to the power k, right? Just because everything is independent. But what's crucial here is that for far points, this probability goes down much faster than for uh, close pairs, right? And that, that's exactly the crucial thing here. And uh, that's actually it. So what we do is we choose k appropriately. I'll, I'll say in a second how to choose it, actually. And then we hash our points using tuples of hash functions simultaneously. And then just enumerate, like given query, we enumerate all the points in the same bucket. So that's the whole reduction. So let's see what parameters we need to choose and what we get in the end. So turns out that the optimal choice of k is such that this point for far pairs becomes smaller than 1 over number of points, or like of order 1 over the number of points. Why? Because in this case, for a query, if you look at its bin, then the number of outliers in this bin, namely far points that we don't really care about, is like constant on average, just by linear linearity of expectation. It's like n times 1 over n is 1, right? So the query time would be constant, actually, in this case. Well, uh, proportional to the dimension, but I think of dimension as something small for the sake of this talk. So we will enumerate constant, con like constant number of points on average. And uh, are we done? No. Because actually, we, we also need to care about probability, probabilities for close pairs. So we would want to find at least one close pair, one close point with decent probability. And uh, if we just do the, this whole thing once, then the probability that it would collide, it's 3 quarters to k. So it's exactly this point. And if you do the math, so if we'll take k from here and put it here, we would get that probability of success would be something like 1 over n to 0.42 or something like this. And in order to boost probability of success to, say, 99%, we would need to repeat this whole thing n to 0.42 times. Uh, so in the end, we have uh, like L hash table, ha hash tables. So here you want the exact nearest neighbor, and you're not? No, no, no. I'm happy with any point within this uh, 45 degree range, let's say. Okay. But for the random case, it would be exact nearest neighbor, yeah. But in general, not necessarily. Question? No. Um, so the overall scheme is like this. We have k times l hyperplanes. So in each hash table, we have k of them, and we have l hash tables overall. And the overall space is something like n to 1.42 and query time n to 0.42. So that's exactly the query time that 
would be typical for this talk, sort of. Square root of n kind of thing. Kind of, yeah. Some polynomial in n. Um, so are there any questions about it? Like, if that's unclear, it's better to spend some time. So I'm, I mean, one thing I'm not very clear is that you're doing worst case, right? I mean, you can't do pre-processing and get like maybe some amortized analysis or something. I mean, this is per query. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's like worst case over queries. So for each, for each query, we succeed with decent probability. But I'm, I mean, I'm wondering like why is that important? Like if I'm allowed to do a pre-processing, then up these points and maintain like over. So what do you propose? I do amortized thing. Like maybe for some amortized over what? Like queries. So you want to be average over queries? Yeah. So it turns out that we don't we don't know any better in this sense. Well. In practice, you know, maybe sort of, but in, in theory at least. N, right? I mean, sorry? Something like, you are getting something like square root of n here. Yeah. And you are saying that's what is the thing I'm, I should expect in Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So in, 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 practice, in practice, succeeding only for like good queries, it kind of makes sense. But uh, in theory, we don't really know any better. So we don't, we don't, know, we don't know how to be like average over queries in some sense. Um, Okay, good. So this is this is a pretty simple argument, and it actually appears in the same paper that introduced LSH and Indic Matwani. And they, they actually like for general case, I, I showed you concrete numbers, but in general case, what you can show is that you can always choose number of tables and number of hash functions per table. So to get uh, space uh, that is n to one plus rho and query time n to rho, where rho is the gap between probabilities of collision uh, for like close pairs and for far pairs. And the proof is exactly the same. It's just instead of concrete numbers, we get this formula. Um, yeah. Um, OK, so that's it for the definition of LSH. Now let me show you the optimal construction for LSH uh, for a sphere. Um, so can we do better than hyperplanes? Uh, so a concrete question you could ask for this specific random instance where I planned queries within 45 degree, can I beat these bounds, which are sort of square root of n and like n to 1.42 space? Can we do that or not? Turns out that we can, and that we observed uh, in our previous paper and like used it uh, in one of the papers I'm going to talk about. And actually, you can do much better. So you can get for the query time you can improve more than quadratically actually. So you can get n to 0.19. Query time and space n to 1.18. Um, and uh, this is actually optimal. So this new bound is optimal, unlike the old one. I I I'll say in a second how it works. But uh, let me just say for now that for spherical case, we understand the best bounds exactly. And of course, of course, I, I, I again tell you the numbers for the random for the random 45 degree case, but of course it works for general case on the sphere. It's just like the formulas will be slightly more complicated. So that's why I'm not showing it here. But let me actually show the construction. The construction is actually pretty simple and clean. Um, and uh, again, as, as, as the hyperplane, it is also inspired by certain approximation algorithms. This time is uh, uh, by a result of Karger, Matwani, and Sudan, who used somewhat similar space partition to round SDPs for coloring. And uh, let, let me call it Voronoi LSH. I'll, I'll explain in a second why we would call it like this. And uh, the construction is actually fairly simple. So we want to hash our points on the sphere. So let me, for this, let me sample, let me choose some parameter t. How to choose it, it's a separate question, not entirely trivial. But let me sample standard d-dimensional Gaussians. So each gi is a d-dimensional uh, iid n01 vector. And then hash of my point would be index of the Gaussian whose dot product with my point is the maximum possible. So pictorially, what happens is something like this. So I sample a bunch of Gaussians. They don't have to lie on the sphere, but I mean, their length will be approximately equal. So let's think of them as uniform vectors from the sphere. It's, it's not going to matter for this discussion. So I basically sample a bunch of random points on the sphere. And then my sphere gets partitioned according to uh, with which Gaussian, it correlates the best. So something along these lines. And th th that's, exactly my, like, that's exactly my space partition. Um, is the construction clear? Yeah. And 
let me just observe that if I sample only two Gaussians, it's exactly the hyperplane LSH. Why? Because if I sample two Gaussians, then my partition would be just hyperplane that is in the middle of these two vectors. So it's exactly equivalent. So this is a natural generalization. Instead of just two regions, we might have more than two regions. And we'll see it will be beneficial for us. Um, OK, let's actually compare it with hyperplanes. So as I said, one hyperplane is exactly the same as Voronoi LSH with two Gaussians, right? Just because it's exactly the same. And uh, turns out that the right way of comparing it is to compare k hyperplanes. So remember that we, like, we basically hash with respect to k independent hyperplanes. And Voronoi LSH with two to k Gaussians. Why is that? Well, because actually it turns out that in, it, it's good to compare. We'll see in a second why. But for now, let me just tell that in both cases, we have two to k regions. So at least it, we can meaningfully compare these things. So for one hyperplane and for two Gaussians, there is no difference. But then when we'll start increasing these things, things start getting interesting. So let, even, even for the two hyperplanes and four Gaussians. So this point is exactly the same on both of these plots. And that has to do with the fact that uh, in both cases, there are two to k regions. But, in this, but for these points, we start seeing difference. And it actually turns out that for Voronoi LSH, we get slightly better, slightly higher probability of collision for like small distances. So it starts kicking in, right? And then when we increase, the gap actually widens. So when we increase to like six hyperplanes versus 64 Gaussians, the gap is actually pretty non-trivial. And uh, you can do the formal analysis and show that if your number of Gaussians grows, the gap between hyperplane LSH and Voronoi LSH increases, and the exponent that we get, it approaches that value 0 0.18 that I promised you. But is it concerning that when you do hyperplanes, it's much simpler partition, so you can Presumably easier. I mean, it's, it's easier for you to understand where you lie in this partition. Precisely. That will be the problem. Mm -hmm. uh, that I'll cover in the second half of the talk. And yes, that's a problem. Uh, so, so what Sergey said is that for k hyperplanes, uh, we can essentially like decide where our point lines in like k operations, roughly speaking. And for Gaussians, we would need to do two to k operations. Yeah. So uh, it comes at the cost in improved improved exponent. But actually, let, let me just tell that for, for the sake of theory, it doesn't matter. We, like, we will choose parameters that it wouldn't matter much. Um, yeah. So, OK. So that's actually it. So this is the optimal LSH construction for a sphere. And now let me tell you how to use it to uh, get the state-of-the-art algorithm for... So one, one, one question, Ray. Um, so this computing dot product, you're taking this as unit operation or...? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So think of dimension as being log n, something like this. Or dimension, okay. Yeah, so it's like proportional to log n. What, what I'm mostly worried in this talk is factors like n to epsilon. So if something is subpolynomial, it's constant for me for the sake of this talk. In practice, it of course matters, and I, I, I'll talk about it. Yeah. <coughs> I, I, I'm going to try to understand one thing. So you're, you're talking about this uh, uniform random uh, uh, case, and then you also made a comment about the general case. Yes. And you said that this would work there as well. Yes. But it's only optimal in the, the optimality proof is in the uniform random case? So optimality proof is for the general case, but when your distance thresholds that you care about roughly correspond to the random case, so namely square root 2 versus square root 2 over your approximation factor. So, uh, what is square root two? Uh, so square root two is the typical distance between two random points on the sphere. Oh, okay. So our optimality, like, uh, in a way, in a way, it shows that, like, you, you can think of our optimality proof is that it's optimal for the random case if you want. Yes, and it immediately implies that it's opti it's optimal for like arbitrary case if your distance thresholds correspond to random case. But whether this construction is optimal or not for two arbitrary distance thresholds, that we can't, like, that we can't yet prove, although I, I, I conjecture that this is the case. So that's the exact state of things. And you would still draw the Gaussians uniformly? Yes. E even if the data is somehow skewed? Even if the data, even if the data is somehow skewed, but uh, so optimality for LSH. So actually, like, I'll cover in a second how to 
do better for the case when your data is skewed. But you would need to do something else. We'll, we'll see. But yeah, it's, it's a very good point. It's like exactly what I'm going to talk about. So uh, now let me tell you about our, uh, about my, like, our first result. And th that appeared in this year's talk. So you can ask, like, OK, so now I talked about the sphere. Now I'm going to slightly switch gears and talk about the whole RD. It's uh, like more general case, so l l let's talk about it. So you can ask, what, what are the best bounds on LSH you can get? And it turns out that for Euclidean distance, and I'm not going to talk much about it, but still, like, it's very interesting to see what happens for Hamming distance and Manhattan distance. Uh, actually, we know exact bounds on the exponent that you can get. So for Euclidean distance, the right bound is 1 over c square, and where c is my approximation factor, remember. And uh, for Hamming distance, it's 1 over c. So in particular, for two approximation, what we get is we get uh, query time something like n to 1 fourth, and square root n for Hamming distance, respectively. And that was established in a sequence of works um, over quite some time, actually. So we, we know exactly best bounds for LSH for L2 and L1. Uh, yeah, and just let me briefly, let me briefly uh, recall that 1 half here means that we get space n to 3 halves and query time square root n. So can we do better than LSH? Uh, so yes, we can. And that's exactly the main point of what I'm going to talk about. And how, how can we do better than LSH? So the basic idea is to do, again, space partitions. But the crucial, the crucial idea is to, to do space partitions that depend on your data. Um, so remember that my definition of LSH, it, it uh, was actually pretty strong. So I required these two conditions for every pair of points. So for every P and Q, I want that if distance is small, than blah. If distance is large, than something else, right? But actually, we don't need it. So for the reduction, what we need is we need to make sure that uh, uh, these conditions hold if one of my points is a data point. And that, that gives us the following possibility. So maybe we, we can look our, at our data set before building the hash family and just like cook some nice hash family that works nicely for this data set, right? And that's exactly what we do. But interestingly enough, not only it works for like good data sets, it actually gives improvement for every data set. So you, 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 you can say that every data set has some structure to exploit, informally speaking. Um, and now let me tell you our results. So basically, we get optimal data dependence space partitions. Optimal after proper formalization. It's a little bit subtle. But again, let's not worry about it for now. And quantitatively, what we get is we get uh, almost quadratic improvement. So for Euclidean distance, we get, uh, say, for two approximation, 1 over 7th instead of 1 over 4. And for Hamming, for Hamming distance, we get 1 one third instead of 1 half. And uh, let me say again that these bounds are optimal for data-dependent LSH if you, do, if, you, if you formalize it properly. Um, so what's the main idea? So basically, our, our algorithm consists of two steps. So first, I'll show you how to handle random data sets, random in the sense as I described. And actually, for the random data set, the spoiler is that uh, Voronoi LSH works well and it gives better bounds. And this step is completely data independent. So if you know that your data set is random, so you just use Voronoi LSH and apply the standard thing. So the second part, which is more interesting, and that's the main point, is how to take any worst case data set that may not necessarily look as random. And then uh, I'll show how to partition it in parts that, for the sake of our algorithm, essentially random. And that, that, that step is data dependent, and it would exactly address your question about like skewed data. But OK, let's first, uh, let, let's first look at the random case. So actually, yeah, so uh, what exactly it means is that we have a sphere, and our points and queries are random. Um, and we use the fact that uh, distances are uh, concentrated around, like if you have, if you have sphere of radius r, then distances are concentrated around square root 2 times r. And uh, Voronoi LSH gives you basically the right, gives you the right exponent. So it, it, it gives you exactly the improved bound, 1 over 2c squared minus 1, which eventually we want to get for every data set. 
But if your data set doesn't look random, then actually Voronoi LSH is suboptimal. And a good example uh, is if your points are, for example, clustered and lie in, lie in a small region of your sphere, then actually Voronoi LSH doesn't work that great and it, gives, uh, it doesn't give good results. And we need, we need to do something about it. And that's exactly where the second part uh, comes, how to reduce from general case to randomly looking case. So if something doesn't look like random, let's make it look random forcefully. So basically, we need to remove structure. So what do I mean by structure here is uh, basically low radius clusters that contain lots of points. I'll say in a second what does it mean to be low radius. But again, like at least conceptually, it should be pretty clear. So if we have any low radius dense clusters, we just take them away, something like this. And I'll show how to how to work with them on the next slide. Of course, we need to do something about them, because what if our near neighbor is one of these points, right? But for now, let's not worry about it. Let's say that we just removed everything. Um, and the crucial thing is that the remainder pretty much looks like a random set. So we know that we have no dense areas anymore, and it kind of spread. So we can apply Vorono LSH and recurse. So after we recurse, so by recurse, I mean we, we apply Vorono LSH, and for each region, we, we do the same. And dense clusters can appear again because that definition was relative, right? So since it has now way fewer points, we, we again potentially can have dense clusters, which we take away and again uh, apply Vorono LSH and recurse. So now, uh, yeah, so before I'll tell you what to do with the clusters, let me tell you how we process queries. Um, so for queries, we actually do the following. So we first query every single cluster. There will not be many of them. We'll choose parameters such that there will be a relatively small amount of them. So we can afford to query every single one of them. And for Warren LSH, we locate uh, one part where our point lies, for example, this one, and recursively query the corresponding part. So that's the whole thing. So the, it remains to tell uh, what we actually need to do for the clusters. I didn't tell, and actually that's pretty crucial. So for clusters, uh, we observe the following thing. Actually, now it's time to tell what exactly it means to be low radius. So by low radius, I mean something that is slightly smaller than half of the sphere. So uh, basically, I declare cluster to be low radius if it has radius, if it is a spherical cap of radius square root 2 minus epsilon times r. So it's slightly, non trivially, but slightly smaller than the half of the sphere. And the uh, crucial thing is that we can actually enclose such a cap into somewhat smaller ball by a factor of 1 minus epsilon square. And that's great. Why? Uh, because we can recurse with the reduced radius. And as I'll explain in a second, we, we, may, we, may, we make actually progress by doing that. So let me state the algorithm again, like the overall algorithm. So we basically, for clusters, we reduce the radius. And after several reductions, the problem essentially becomes trivial for certain reasons. And for the random remainder, Warren LSH works well. So that's exactly conceptually how we handle different cases. And uh, at some level, it can be seen as a decision tree what we get. So we start with the root. Then we take out uh, dense clusters. Then we have random remainder, which we partition using Voronoi LSH, and then we recursively do the same thing for everything. And when we query, we can go potentially to several subtrees. So as I said, we, qu we query all the clusters and one part, and uh, again, it continues branching. Um, and the parameters we get are the following. So you can show that, we can, uh, that my tree occupies near linear space, and query time can be bounded by some subpolynomial function. And that's great. And of course, as before, one tree would not be enough because it would give you only polynomially small probability of success. So we need many of them to succeed with probability 99%. So that's actually it. So is it any questions about it? Yeah, so one, one, one line summary is that we observe that Voron LSH works great for random data sets. And then if something doesn't look random enough, just like make it random. OK, so now let me tell you a little bit about our second result. And actually, the second result is 
how to make Voronoi LSH practical. And that has to do with uh, Sergey's question. Uh, and uh, that's our NIPS paper. Um, is Voronoi LSH practical? No. Why? Because uh, convergence to the optimal exponent is on the one hand very slow. So we need lots of Gaussians to make it asymptotically good. And uh, at the same time, evaluation time is roughly dimension times number of Gaussians. So, and that's bad. Even say, for example, 64 Gaussians is already pretty much impractical. And that wouldn't bring us even close to the optimal exponent. So can we do anything about it? It would be nice to do something because actually hyperplane LSH, it's, it's used quite a bit in various forms in practice. And it uh, would be nice to uh, like, uh, use theory to get some practical improvements. Can we do something? Yes, that, that's exactly the point of the second part. So let's make, let's make our Voronoi LSH practical step by step. So the first step is to um, make our set of vectors a little bit more structured. So Voronoi LSH, it samples a bunch of random vectors, and that might not necessarily be that great, uh, because that brings us, like, the, the, that makes the evaluation time slow. Let's make it like less random, less arbitrary in some sense. And that, that actually, uh, there was a very nice paper by Tarasava and Tanaka who showed, uh, who, who proposed such a scheme, they didn't analyze it, but at least they proposed a possible improvement to Voronoi LSH, and what they proposed is, instead of random vectors, use plus minus basis vectors. So basically you, um, if you want to hash your point on a sphere, you perform a random rotation, and then after you do random rotation, you find the closest plus minus basis vector. So for example, for the case of two, we partition everything in four parts. And uh, for, for general high dimensions, we will have cross polytope. So for dimension D, we will have two D parts. Um, yeah, so in this paper, we actually, for the first time, analyze this scheme rigorously and show that it gives almost the same quality as Voronoi LSH with 2D Gaussians. Again, we choose 2D Gaussians because it's the same number of parts. So essentially, we show that by moving from uh, Gaussians to this structured set of vectors, if we do random rotation first, then it gives almost the same result. And in a way, you can think of it as like blessing of dimensionality, actually. So exponent improves as dimension grows because number of Gaussians effectively grows, right? And it's still not that great because random rotations are expensive. So applying random rotations takes, takes d square time. And storing it also takes d square reals. So it seems that we didn't do that much progress, but in fact we did. So just like wait for the next slide. Uh, and the way we did progress is that at least the second step, finding the closest plus minus basis vector, now it's cheap. You can do it in like one scan over your coordinates. It takes d time instead of d square. So that's exactly the progress. So second idea is to use pseudo-random rotations. So as I said, the bottleneck is to store and apply random rotations, and that would be expensive. So instead, we use pseudo-random rotations. And they, they were introduced in the, in the paper by Ailon and Chazelle, and since, when, since then, they were used in like many other places in both theory and like applied papers and so on. It's like very beautiful idea. If you want to like basically if you want to learn one idea from this talk, I, I want you like to. Paper. Sorry? No, no, no. It's it's like you you'll see. It's it's really nice. So we want to do uh, something that would serve roughly as a random rotation, but without doing the whole random rotation. So what we do is the following thing. So instead of random rotation, let's do Hadamard transform. So what is a Hadamard transform? It's a certain orthogonal map that preserves all two norms. So it's certain rotation. And it has two properties. In one, like one vague property is that it mixes well. I, I might say in a second what it actually means. But what's more crucial is that it's fast. So we can compute it in time d log d. So what is a Hadamard transform? It's a, uh, a recursively defined matrix uh, th th that is the following. Like 0, Hadamard transform is just 1. And then it gets replicated four times. And in one copy, we flip all the signs. So it's basically plus minus 1 matrix. Uh, with pairwise orthogonal rows and columns. Um, so this is nice, but of course it's a deterministic map and we want to inject some randomness. So the crucial idea in Ilon and Chazelle paper was to 
flip signs at random before applying Hadamard transform. So basically, for every coordinate, we toss a coin. And for, like, say, heads, we change the signs. For tails, we don't do anything. And then we apply Hadamard transform. And for their application, that was enough. But for our application, it's not quite enough. Why? Because, for example, suppose that we started with a one sparse vector. So it's a vector with only one non-zero, like, say, first basis vector. Then if I flip the sign, it could be plus minus first basis vector. And even after I apply Hadamard transform, it can be one of the two vectors. And that's not good enough for us. But what is good enough for us is to repeat this whole thing a couple of times. And that, 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 then it works. So l l with the caveat that we don't know how to prove that it works, but it works empirically well. And I conjecture that it actually works in theory well. It's just I don't know how to prove it. And th that's actually pretty much it. Uh, so the overall hashing scheme is to perform two or three rounds of flip signs Hadamard, and then find the closest vector from plus minus basis vectors, which essentially boils down to like finding maximum coordinate or something like this. Um, and evaluation time becomes d log d instead of d square. And that's exactly where we save a lot. And uh, again, this is the statement I don't yet know how to prove. But empirically, it seems that it's pretty much equivalent to the cross polytope LSH with truly random rotations, which are rigorously equivalent to Voronoi LSH with 2D Gaussians. So is it clear? Yeah. So just, just to make sure I understand the M2N -end thing. So you have this transformation, this two, three rounds of flipping in Hadamard. Mm -hmm. And then, so you start, you have a query point, you run it through this, and then what do you get? You get the, close, the, the closest vector, mm -hmm. and then you, you, so we, your data is already uh, um, in a way that you immediately get to a set of points, and one of them is, is close. So the good, good way of thinking about it, we just use it as, as an LSH and plug it into the reduction that I described. So then for like every hash table, you would have several of these things. So you, you think of it as a hash. So it takes a point and gives you a number from 1 to d. So that's the hash. Right? It's like closest, or like from 1 to 2d in this case. So that, that just which basis vector is the closest. And then you do the same as I described before. So you just do several of these hashes and um, just compute these several hashes for the query and look up the corresponding bean and retrieve all the data points from there. So now you have the union of many, many beans. Rather intersection. Because you want to collide on all the all the all the k hash functions, and then you do union. So then the overall thing you repeat many times to boost probability of success to like 99 or whatever you want. And then in this union, you just uh, what you do? try all the points. You try all of them and just find the clo the closest one. Yeah. So how many how many points are in that union? So we set parameters such that in one hash table, you would have one like, or like five or like constant number of far points, and everything else is close. So we are happy with those. And for the union, you just get that essentially uh, number of bad points is roughly the same as number of hash tables. So it's some like n to some power. How many, how many hash tables? I'm, I'm so let, let, me actually, let me actually go back to the slide where I show it for the hyperplanes. And for this LSH, it's the same. It's the same. I see. Yeah. Do, do you compute this Adamar transform for, uh, kind of for, every, uh, for every bin and for every uh, hash code? Or no, we compute it. Uh, so we compute it for. Every hash table, we compute three times k Hadamard transform. So essentially, we, in total for a query, we compute like three times k times l Hadamard transform. So you, you recompute. Yeah, you, you need, right? You need to recompute. You can't. I mean, if you, if, you, if you wouldn't need to do it, that would be very nice. That would save a lot. But mm. Yeah, so this slide. So basically, uh, so now think of, uh, we use uh, the, uh, our um, uh, Hadam, like, I, I'm not sure how to call it, cross polytope hash instead of hyperplane hash. So, in, uh, so we hash our point using k copies, k independent copies of our uh, hash functions from our family. So this is the parameter k. And we also have parameter l. 
uh, which is how many tables we have. So in total, we have k times l hash functions and l hash tables. And for the hyperplanes, we have n to 0.42 tables. For the cross polytope, we would have had n to 0.18. So some small polynomial, relatively. And k is something like logarithm of n. OK? So it's exactly the same reduction, just instead of hyperplanes, use cross polytope. And it works much better. Um, OK, let's go back. Actually, I have time. So I have 10 minutes, right? OK. So now uh, let me turn to the actually quite a big issue, memory consumption. So if you look at, like, there are lots of papers that do nearest neighbor search in high dimensions, say, in practice. And many of them use LSH as a baseline. And in many papers, you'd see statements like this. LSH is terrible because it can, can, consumes lots of memory. Let's try to figure out if it's true or not. So we actually can do, can do math and compute exactly how many tables we would need. For example, for hyperplane LSH, for that random instance that I told you with 45 degrees. So if you have million points and your queries are within 45 degrees at random, then you would need to achieve probability 0.9, you would need 725 tables. So that's terrible, actually. It's like million points, come on, it's not like, pff, it's, it's nothing, right? Now, now we would more like care about like billions of points, if not more, right? So 725 times to replicate the whole thing, that, that's not what we want, right? But turns out that there is a very nice solution for this. It's called multiprobe LSH, and it was introduced uh, in a very nice VLDB 2007 paper. Um, and basically, the idea is like this. I'm not going to tell you in a full detail, but the idea is in each table, we can query more than one, more than one bean. So of course, the best bean to query is uh, which collides with all our hashes, right? But intuitively, we would also might, might want to look at the beans that almost collide. So let's say they collide on all copies except one, or something like this. So the, 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 they have a very nice heuristic way how to do it. And actually, there are theory papers that kind of analyze this, um, something similar to this multiprobe LSH, but uh, it's, they, they analyze something way less practical. But in practice, you would want to use multiprobe LSH. And one of the contributions of this paper is we have similar scheme for cross polytope. It's a little bit more tricky. Uh, the, main, the main source of trickiness is that for hyperplanes, you have only two regions. So we just need to decide whether we switch or not in each thing. Here, we need to decide by how much we switch, roughly speaking. But it can be done. So we did quite a few experiments. Let me just so show one of the experiments. It's, uh, mm, it's on the shift, like it's on the data set of shift features for, uh, I think it's called ImageNet or something, nah, I'm not sure. So it's basically a certain data set of images. From, from that data set, there were shift features computed. <coughs> and the parameters are, we have million points in dimension 128, right? So the linear scan takes 38 milliseconds. It's actually not that great data set because linear scan is already pretty fast. But nevertheless, even like compared to 38 milliseconds, uh, this whole thing improves things quite a bit. So with hyperplane and multiprobe, you can improve by a factor of two, and cross polytope improves even further. So th this is not the biggest gap between hyperplane and cross polytope I can show you, uh, but even here it already works better. And uh, in practice, you would not just want to like take your data set and apply, uh, say, Cross polytope LSH. So in fact, it turns out that for this specific data set, you can look at it, stare at it a little bit, cluster it a little bit, recenter, and then actually improve uh, both, like improve results for both hyperplane LSH and cross polytope LSH. And here the gap is a little bit larger, actually. So cross polytope benefits a little bit more from it. And we, we have other experimental results if you if you are interested in like applying something like this for your applications, like read our paper. So this is just some concrete numbers. Uh, so how much memory? Oh, so yeah, yeah it's, it's a great question. So uh, we require it to use the same amount of memory as the data set itself. Thank so you. it roughly doubles the size of the data set. So it's actually pretty reasonable. So you, you wouldn't use like 725 tables or anything like this. Uh, if you use more memory, actually uh, both hyperplane and cross polytope benefit from it. Um, yeah. 
precise. So, okay, so that's pretty much it. Um, there are actually lots of open questions here. Some of them are hard, some of them are easy, some of them are meaningful, some of them are not so much. Um, but uh, what I showed in this talk, so like essentially I showed you two results. Optimal data dependent hashing for the whole L2, which is a theory result, and practical and optimal LSH for the spherical case, which is more applied. And I'd say the main open question, which I really like and I have no idea how to approach it, is to have practical version of our worst case to random reduction. That would essentially make the first bullet point practical. And if it is possible to do, I don't know. But it would be very nice. Yeah. So all of this is, uh, again, finding one point that's close enough. What if I want to find all the close points? Uh, you want to just, within certain distance threshold, recover everything? And approximation, however, is reasonable. So I'm willing to accept some you know, notion of approximation, mm -hmm. but I want to find you know, all of the appropriate, appro approximately find all the nearest neighbors. Good. So here, the analysis shows that for every point from this set that you care about, we would find it with probability 99%. So it means that on average, we'll recover 99% of all the points, of all the closed points. I see. The, so the, again, this set that at the end of the day I'm enumerating over and doing some brute force search is yes. some set that's yes. already pretty much all the neighbors. Pretty much. So at least 99% of them. So you can just uh, essentially repeat this many times and boost this to whatever you want. Yeah, yeah. the hash. Of course, uh, if you if you do something like this, your running time would depend on how large your date, like how large this set is. But right, you can't do better than the size of the set. So. Uh, so you, you would get something like n to row plus the size of the set time or something. Any more questions? Yeah, I have another one. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Maybe again, this is tri maybe this is the same as my previous question, and maybe it's okay. not, but still trivial. So if I want to find a, this the single closest point. With like absolutely closest. Absolutely closest okay. point with high probability. Yeah. Then I understand that 99% of the closed ones are, are nearby. Yeah, but you don't necessarily find this closest point because you would, uh, you would like, basically, again, like uh, how the analysis goes. You say that in your bin, there are essentially no far points. So it means that you would very quickly find some close point, but not necessarily the closest. So actually finding exactly closest neighbors, uh, in theory, it's very hard. Precisely, like, I, I wouldn't expect I wouldn't expect it to be possible to do in like high dimensions and strongly sublinear time unless your space is huge. But what you can do often in practice is to say that look, my data set is such that I have a query, I have a like exactly closest neighbor, no approximation, and then there are not that many points which are not much uh, like not much further than that. And that that often happens actually. For instance, in in this shift. Oh yeah, I, I, I might. I, I should have told you that here we look at the like this like here the times are of, for probability 0.9 for finding exact nearest neighbors. Of course, no approximation because it has this property that there are not that many approximately closest points. Everything else is concentrated much further. So in this case, that, that's actually your best bet, and that you can always like you can often see in the, in, in practice. But other than that, not really. Unless you want bad dependence on the dimension. So there are lower bonds for exact? So you can, for instance, show that uh, if you can do polynomial preprocessing and strongly sublinear query time, you can do SAT better than 2 to n. It's very easy to show. So there are, there are lower bounds. They are not that convincing because this assumption that SAT you can't do better than 2 to n is like really strong, but we don't know how to do it at least. So I wouldn't expect it to be possible. At least easily, let's say. Yeah. 